All right, Alexander, let's talk about what is going on in Russia. And let's talk about Putin's speech that he gave yesterday evening, about a five-minute speech. He talked about uh, everything that happened over the, the weekend, over the last uh, couple of days with uh, Prigozhin and the mutiny. What, uh, what were your first thoughts with uh, Putin's speech my own personal view is that it demonstrated that the entire way in which the mutiny was dealt with was essentially the way that he chose to do it. He made it very clear that it was his orders that bloodshed was to be avoided at all costs. And I think it shows again the fact that he was a skillful politician, He's, that he is a skillful politician. He was trying to consolidate, bring together the whole of Russian society. He said that the last thing we wanted was to have a uh, blood on the streets. The purpose of his speech yesterday, so it seemed to me, is to explain to Russians why he took the decision not to proceed with prosecutions of Prigozhin. He called him a traitor in the speeches a few days ago. Now he's allowing Prigozhin to go to Belarus. So Putin wanted to explain that. He wanted to say, it was my decision... I took this decision, I did it in order to avoid bloodshed at a time when we are at war, at any time. We do not want to see that kind of civil war type scenario playing out on our streets and in our cities. So for that reason, he took the decision to avoid, uh, to avoid uh, um, a military confrontation. And I think that he was right. He took the correct approach. Yeah, I, I also agree. I think it was the, the correct approach um, to... I mean, in, in your videos, you actually said, I think it was a, a cost-benefit analysis to, to take the approach of, uh, of, in this instance, given everything that's going on with the conflict in Ukraine, with the conflict uh, against the collective West, the, the sensible approach to, to dealing with uh, the mutiny, um, was to was to finish it uh, quickly, to deal with it quickly, and to, uh, to to make sure that that violence was avoid avoided. In order, I think, for two reasons: one is to to protect the Russian people so they don't see this happening in Russia, but also to not not give more ammunition to the collective West. Yes, exactly. The collective West, the international reaction. If there'd been pictures of violence all over the world, you know, the world had seen Russian soldiers, Wagner soldiers, regular army soldiers fighting each other in Russian cities, it would have been catastrophic. It would have completely overturned, uh, turned upside down Russia's internal position. So what, what they did, what Putin did is actually it's very simple. And I think, I, you know, we just ought to explain it briefly. They blockaded, they blocked the roads to Moscow. So this convoy of troops that Prigozhin sent towards Moscow, it was interrupted, it couldn't reach Moscow without having to battle its way through. And the latest reports, by the way, suggest there was only about 3,000 men in that convoy, and they were apparently starting to have concerns and doubts about what they were being led to do. And then there was the other force of Wagner fighters who were in Rostov, where Prigozhin himself was located. There was a couple of thousand of them there. And again, there was a very large force of Chechen fighters being assembled to attack them. So, in effect, Prigozhin was put in a no-win situation. He was in a checkmate situation. So that what Putin then did is he got Lukashenko to telephone Prigozhin. There were negotiations. Prigozhin gave up on all his demands... Shoigu, the defence minister, is still there. He was on television yesterday. He was in inspecting military units yesterday. He's clearly not going anywhere. There's no word that General Gerasimov, the chief of staff, is going to be removed. I know lots of people support Prigozhin's desire to get rid of Gerasimov. I'm not entirely sure why, by the way, but that's a discussion for another time. But he's not going there I anywhere either. I 
I want you. I want you to answer that yeah. after you're done explaining. Okay. I want you to okay. answer the Shoigu Yerasimov. I will. Uh, I will. Okay. I will. I will discuss it. Animosity. I want you to explain why the I, animosity towards it. But anyway, keep keep on going. I, I will do yeah. that. And and the only deal that was done, the only deal that was done with Prigozhin, is that the case against him, that was still being investigated as of yesterday, would be dropped provided he left for Belarus. And in fact, the latest word is that he is now in Belarus, that he's actually got on his private jet and has flown to Belarus. So that's the, that is the entirety de- of the deal that was done, except that his own fighters, those who participated in this mutiny, will get uh, um, an amnesty. Now, this is a capitulation by Prigozhin. Prigozhin achieved none of the objectives that he set out to achieve. He didn't get Shoigu or Gerasimov sacked. He didn't establish himself as the power in Moscow. Essentially, he turned round, was faced by a checkmate situation. His own life by this point was at risk. So he accepted the terms Putin gave to him, set for him, which were brokered, or rather conveyed to Prigozhin by Lukashenko. So this was a bloodless defeat of the mutiny. I mean, in my opinion, it was clear that Prigozhin was trying to achieve some kind of big breakthrough in Moscow itself. He failed. He failed utterly. He failed. He was defeated essentially bloodlessly. The only violence that was committed was committed by Prigozhin and his men themselves. They seem to have shot down one Russian aircraft that we know about. There's rumours they shot down some helicopters as well. So there's possible murder charges hanging over Prigozhin as well, which we mustn't overlook. And potentially, if he decides to return to Russia and does so without permission, then he could be facing treason charges as well. The Wagner organization is to be completely absorbed into the Russian military. We're getting reports now that all the heavy weapons they had are now being transferred to the control of the Russian regular military. The Wagner force itself is going to be absorbed into the Russian military. As such, on Russian territory, it will cease to exist. There is this rump Uh, Some people say four, others say six, others say 8,000 fighters that followed Prigozhin in this adventure. This is 8,000 out of a total force of 32,000. So about a quarter of the men participated, but most of them didn't. Anyway, that rump of around 8,000, they've been given a choice. They can either stay in Russia, return to civilian life, or they can follow Prigozhin into Belarus. And there's again word that the Belarusian authorities are preparing camps for them. And if they go to Belarus, they will basically fall under Lukashenko's control. Okay, so why the vitriol for uh, Shoigu and uh, and Yerasimov? And I think that more people uh, are upset with Shoigu, I would say, than Yerasimov, which is kind of odd, uh, I, I understand the corruption stuff. I understand that some people feel like you know the the SMO is not going as as well as, as well as it should or as fast as it should, uh, whatever the opinion is. But why 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 are there certain people, certain communities that that are upset with Shoigu and Yerasimov? Well, I, I'm going to say what I think about Shoigu. I think the first thing to say about Shoigu is that until a short time ago, I mean about two years ago, before this conflict began, the general consensus in Russia was that he was an excellent minister. He took over a Ministry of Defence that had been thrown into complete chaos by his predecessor, a man called Serdyukov. There were major corruption scandals in the logistics departments of the Ministry of Defence. Serdyukov initiated a whole set of reforms of the military structures, which appeared to be intended to put them more on uh, Western lines, which were deeply unpopular with the military and which were thought to have worked badly. 
And on top of all of that, he made some very eccentric decisions. He put the military in new uniforms, or so tried to, which looked very Western. Again, not particularly popular with much of the military. And in general, he was a deeply unpopular minister. When Shoigu came in, he had been a very successful minister of the emergencies ministry in Russia. He was popular at the time. He was brought in. He reorganised things. He put them back on a proper footing. And the general consensus, as I said, until about two years ago, was that he was an excellent minister. So why the change? I, I'm going to suggest that partly Shoigu has acted as a lightning conductor in the sense that there are some people in Russia um, on the very strong nationalist right especially, who um, don't want to criticise Putin directly, but feel that policy towards Ukraine and towards the West and the conduct of the military operation in general have been too moderate, has been much too moderate. They don't want to criticise Putin, so they take out a lot of their animus against Shoigu. And the second thing is, of course, that Shoigu himself is a civilian. Now, his background is in civil engineering. He's got a military rank, which is general of the army, which he was appointed to when he was head of Emicon. But he is not a professional soldier. And there is a powerful constituency in Russia which continues to believe that, as was often, but by no means always the case, in Soviet times, the defence ministry should be headed by a professional soldier, by someone drawn directly from the military. In other words, it ought to be a military position. Now, I would stress this is by no means always the case in Soviet times. The first Soviet minister, minister of defence was, by the way, Leon Trotsky, who was obviously not a military person. Stalin's Two most important defence ministers, apart from himself, were Voroshilov and Bulganin, who were also civilians, and Brezhnev's most important defence minister, a man called Ustinov, was also a civilian. But people tend to forget that, and they remember the fact that in other times, people like Marshal Zhukov and General Ma Marshal Malinovsky and people like that were defence ministers. And they feel that the military should be run by the military. The defence ministry should be run by the ministry, military themselves. Now, I have to say, I think this is probably an outdated view. It, it misunderstands the dynamics of how these organisations work. It probably actually makes more sense to have a civilian administrator in charge of the bureaucracy that is the, the military itself, but there is this constant hankering for a real military officer to run the Ministry of Defence, and that has exposed Shoigu, who of course is not a real military officer, it's exposed him to criticisms. Yeah, I, I remember when I was in, in Moscow, like 2017, 18, people loved Shoigu. I mean, they loved Shoigu, like he was like one of the most popular uh, ministers. Do, do you think, real quick before I get to, to my next question, do you think that a lot of uh, Prigozhin's rants uh, about Shoigu cut through? Do you think they gained traction? Yes, yes they did. I, I don't think there's any doubt. First of all, I mean, he was playing, Prigozhin was playing on some people's feelings, which already pre-existed. I mean, these criticisms of Shoigu, uh, which, as I said, some of them are really criticisms of Putin, the fact that, you know, this war is not being waged aggressively enough. For Russian foreign policy has not been waged aggressive eno aggressively enough altogether. So the, there was a constituency that did, to some extent, argue these things. In my opinion, before Prigozhin came along, it was relatively small. What Prigozhin has done it, done is he's greatly amplified it, so many more people have heard of these criticisms now, both in Russia and abroad. And that, that has changed some of the feeling that exists about Shoigu. So where before, 
He was perhaps the most popular minister in the Russian government. He's now become, well, perhaps not exactly unpopular with the Russian public, but he's lost a lot of his popularity, and Prigozhin has undoubtedly played a big part in, a big part in that. Yeah, if I told you, though, three years ago, that Russia would be number one in air defense, number one in hypersonic missiles, and most importantly, that Russia would be outproducing the entire collective West, not the United States, not Germany, the entire collective West in ammunition. I would say 99.9% .9 of, of people would be like, you know, no, come on, that's, that's impossible. Not to mention that, uh, you know, there were bumps in the mobilization, but for the most part, mobilizing 300,000 plus people is not an easy task. Uh, I mean, well, uh, on a performance level, it doesn't seem like he's, he's doing poorly. Actually, it seems like he's doing very well, well on an administrative level, especially when you compare him to, say, Ben Wallace. <laughs> Absol absolutely. I mean, I, he's doing extremely well, as, by the way, is Gerasimov. Now, can I just speak briefly about Gerasimov as well? Now, Gerasimov is the chief of the general staff, and he is in overall charge of the military. He deals with strategic planning. He also comes up with, uh, he deals with a lot of the planning of the war. He's also the overall commander of the forces in Ukraine. But he is Russia's major military leader. He is also, and this is a view that is widely acknowledged throughout the West, very much a military intellectual and a very, very capable military theorist. In fact, a very original military theorist and many people feel a very brilliant one. So, I mean, you know, he's the person who comes up with tactics. He's the person who says these are the kind of weapons we need. He, we, we need, you know, to develop hypersonic missiles to counter the West in this way. We need this kind of electronic warfare. He sets out the guidelines which the industry then is supposed to produce. And as Chief of General Staff... He was the person who was in charge of the mobilisation, of getting all of these troops brought into the military, trained, assigned to their various units. And again, all, to all appearances, he's done this very well. And then the third person who forms the sort of trinity of decisions uh, of this group that is mostly involved in the military side of things is Medvedev, the former prime minister and the former president, who's in overall charge of the military industries, whose job it is to produce all the weapons that Shoigu and Gerasimov say that are needed. And in the Russian system, these three people work very closely together. I mean, you, every, they are absolutely a part of a team. And that team appears to work well. But... And I have to say this, what you tend to find is that just as I said sometimes with neocons, that they don't really take much interest in the logistical and infrastructural and organisational and administrative side of things, so it is the same with some of the critics of Shoigu and Gerasimov in Russia. What they are concerned with purely is tactical events on the battlefields. They don't want to criticise Putin, even though, as I've said many times, those people who worry about the war having gone slowly probably at some level understand that that is a political choice dictated by Putin himself, not by Shoigu or Gerasimov or Medvedev. They're simply implementing Putin's instructions, which are political instructions. They're not interested in... They don't want to criticise Putin. And of course, in terms of weapons production, in terms of organisation of troops, in terms of all of those things, they are less interested in those things and perhaps don't understand the complexities or the enormous managerial challenges that, that, um, pose, that those sort of things pose and the fact that actually this group, this trio of Shoigu, Medvedev and Gerasimov are doing a very good job. To the extent that they ever acknowledge it, 
they say that what Russia needs to do is to go over completely to a kind of Soviet-style command economy that, uh, um, you know, produced weapons in enormous quantities. If we simply revert to that system, that will produce all the weapons we need. They don't worry too much about what the effect will be on the civilian economy, but they say to themselves, that will be enough. And of course, what they don't realise again is that uh, a Soviet-style command economy also needs highly experienced and capable administrators, managers like um, Shoigu is, and like Ustinov and Bulganin were in the past when they served as defence ministers under Stalin and Brezhnev. Yeah, and, you know, just real quick on Putin, you know, he makes these political decisions to, to go slow, and, uh, and he doesn't only have to consider the defence side of things. We've done many videos on this. He has to consider the foreign ministry and their input. He has to consider the, 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 the domestic economy. He has to consider the, the economic war that the collective West is, is waging on Russia. I mean, he's got to take all of these things, process them, and come out with, with his orders and decisions. And all of these ministries, they have to, they have to implement those, uh, those orders. And you know, there's, there's a lot of you know, talk about the pace of the conflict, but if you take a step back and, and look at how things have progressed for Russia, especially when you compare it to the collective West, and we're talking 50 countries that have waged uh, war with Russia, Russia seems to be uh, handling things pretty well. Uh, you know, the, the, the economy's humming along, the collective West is continuing to wait for when, when Russia will run out of missiles and it's not happening. And so, you know, it seems like, like the entire team has, has been working well together. I, I completely, um, I completely yeah. agree. I mean, I, I, I entirely agree. Now, the one thing I would say about this is, of course, the one real, the, the great problem, the great danger that Putin has faced running things slow in this way is that it, he would invite domestic political criticism and that has happened and this is where perhaps it's the one good thing from his point of view that has come out of the Prigozhin affair because of course Prigozhin did try to capitalize on that criticism in order to launch whatever it was that he was trying to do and what has happened is that confronted with the choice do they go with Prigozhin, who to some extent seems to be echoing their various criticisms, or do they back Putin? Well, a lot of these people who have been making these criticisms, people like Strelkov, for example, for them it became clear instantly that there was no choice, that they had to support Putin. So in a kind of a way, what Prigozhin has done through his mutiny, Let's call it a mutiny. Through his mutiny, is that he smoked out those people who some people call the sixth colonists, the hardline rightist types who believe that the war should be prosecuted in a different way. They're no longer the threat to Putin that they might have been before. And I think that is an important consequence of this affair. Yeah, uh, mutiny, Lavrov, in an interview with RT. He, he threw out the word coup, he threw out the word regime change a lot. He used that word quite a lot, regime change. That was Lavrov speaking to RT. And yeah, the, the risk that you run when you, when you take this slow uh, grinding approach is that you do open up the, the possibility of, of things, of surprises occurring, unexpected things happening when, when you take your time to, to execute things. Okay, I mean, that's, that's one of the risks. Um, fi final question. Uh, what, what do you make of, of Belarus's role in all of this? What do you make of Lukashenko's role? A lot of talk about uh, a strike from, from Belarus to Kiev. This was, this was a 5D chess move, let's say, and Putin was able to move forces into Belarus and now he can he can strike from north 
to south to Kiev. Yeah, what I mean, do you I, make I, of all of those? I, 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 I've seen I've seen these theories that this is five or six or seven or twenty dimensional chess. I'm afraid I don't believe that. I mean, uh, you only have to listen to the way Putin is talking to understand immediately that you know this he he's extremely angry uh, uh, about about this affair and that he um, you know did not welcome it at all and a point i made in my last video which is that the la no government in my experience wants to create the impression around the world that it is at risk of losing control by organizing what is in effect a coup against itself and certainly not the russian government and you only have to remember Russian history to understand why. This is a government that is particularly anxious to convey to the world the impression that things in Russia are stable and that it is in full control of the country. So I don't buy this five or six or seven dimensional chess story that this is all done as a complicated way of sending troops, more troops into Belarus or building up the Northern Front. If Putin and Lukashenko had wanted to do that. Nothing would have prevented them doing it, and they could have done it quietly, and they didn't need to go through this bizarre piece of theatre in order to achieve it. But what is now absolutely clear is that whatever historic issues existed between Putin and Lukashenko, and they did once exist, they have now been fully resolved after the 2020 regime colour revolution attempt in Belarus, Lukashenko finally understood that the only way forward for him was close alignment with Russia. He's become increasingly concerned about the threats to him from the West. In his speech, which he made today, he also referred to the fact that there was this regiment of Belarusian exiles fighting in Ukraine. And apparently, according to him, whilst the coup Prigozhin's event was underway. They also tried to march into Belarus, but were turned back. I mean, it's not very clear exactly what he meant by this, but that was the sort of impression he, he seemed to convey. And basically, he he's now says, without Russia, we're all lost. So Belarus and Russia are now converging, and we can see how useful for Russia Belarus has now become because he can bring out Lukashenko to talk to Prigozhin. Lukashenko is now essentially a part of the same team as Putin, Shoigu, Lavrov, all of those. They're all part, they're all now working together. And of course, he's also become the place where, you know, Prigozhin will be transferred to Belarus, such as his troops um, want to follow him, they'll be sent to Belarus as well. You can be absolutely sure, given the kind of man Lukashenko is, that they'll be brought under firm control there. More Russian troops, I'm sure, will be entering Belarus very soon. And to be completely frank, looking at the kind of things that Lukashenko is now saying, I think that the days of a, some kind of reunification, formal reunification, between Belarus and Russia are, are, are now not far off. I mean, I think probably at the conclusion of this special military operation, if the Russians achieve their objectives in Ukraine, about which I have no doubt, then, as I said, we will see further moves to accelerate the integration processes between Russia and Belarus. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Um, yeah, anyone that's followed Putin understands that the Putin administration is obsessed with stability. <laughs> I mean, they're absolutely obsessed with stability. So, I mean, there, there's, there's no chance that, that this was some sort of elaborate uh, scheme or, or, or anything like that. Um, and, and if they wanted to move troops, well, you know, Russia and Belarus, they deployed... Uh, nuclear weapons in Belarus, and it, it didn't, you know, they decided it, and they did it. So if they wanted to move troops, they would make the decision, and they would move them, they wouldn't do all of this, all of this stuff. And, and Garland, I, I was watching Garland Nixon's show today, just one final point, and he brought up uh, the fact that, you know, why would, why would Russia 
go through this? Why would Putin go through all of this uh, in, in coordinating with Prigozhin? And, and you put at risk your economy, your currency, your stock markets through all this, this instability. I mean, no country wants that. No, no. country wants that. Anyway. Um, no, absolutely not. I mean, especially, as you said, not Putin. I mean, Putin has prioritized macroeconomic stability above everything else because uh, he remembers how the Soviet Union collapsed. I mean, it was because macroeconomic stability was lost. So he's not going to put that at risk. And of course, he also, he, he also he's a very historically minded man. He also knows how the economic difficulties that the Tsarist government faced during the First World War, combined with the political tr intrigues that were taking place in Russia at that time, how they also brought about the collapse of, of Russia, and as he said absolutely correctly, led eventually to a civil war and a defeat in the First World War. So in no way is he going to take those kind of risks. This is a deeply risk-averse man, and I think people need to understand that if they haven't understood it already. Putin is super risk-averse. And, and one of the great achievements of, uh, of Russia in this conflict with the West was the economic side of things. Absolutely. Why would you put that all at risk? Absolutely. I mean, that was a huge achievement, the fact that the economy did not sink given all the sanctions that, uh, that were thrown at it. So why would you put any of that at risk? Uh, one very, very quick question, though. I'm, I'm, I'm just curious. All these troops in this camp, what exactly is Lukashenko going to do with them? I mean, what do you think? I mean, I'm trying to understand what they're building this camp and, and you're going to have these Wagner guys and you have Prigozhin hanging around. I mean, what ex it's hard well, for you it, to know. It, I mean, it, what's, it, what's your guess? Well, I, I, I think that the telephone lines between Moscow and Minsk are, are buzzing with discussions about this because, of course, decanting uh, Prigozhin into Belarus and sending, you know, the four, six, eight thousand men that might follow him there to Belarus might potentially create more problems in future. So I think both Putin and uh, Lukashenko and their advisors are going to be thinking very, very hard about what they're going to do with these people. And my own personal guess, and I mean, this is, I'm taking this a bit from John Helmer, the eventual intention is to get Prigozhin out of B Belarus as well, and perhaps to send all these troops on their various contracts in Africa and places like that. Uh, Helmer, who has contacts within the uh, Russian mili military, uh, says that the intentional plan is to send them off to Africa. And that wouldn't surprise me if that's exactly what, he's, what they're going to do. Yeah. All right. Very interesting. Okay. Uh, the Durant .com. We are on Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, Rockfin, and Telegram. And go to Durant Shop, 10% off. Use the code. Good day. Take care.